It's faster than a rifle bullet on the edges of space. It appeals to both sides of the brain, the scientific side and the artistic side. You can see all these 747s 20,000 feet below you. You are going 800 miles an hour faster than they are. It's a fast jet front, an airliner main cabin. We had some incredible experiences. Everybody would find Conkle fitted somewhere. It's such a beautiful, powerful show. Farnborough, southern England in the early 1960s. And at the British Aircraft Corporation hangar, a new and revolutionary project was being undertaken. After an historic agreement had been reached in 1962 between the British and French governments, the stage had been set for the design and production of an aircraft that was to push the boundaries of technology. A high-speed dawn in civil aviation had arrived, the Concorde era. Machines and men, human brains and electronic brains, working together so that airline passengers of the 1970s can fly in confidence and in comfort far above the earth and at twice the speed of sound. The dream of building a supersonic aircraft had become a reality and with it came significant problems. The first to design a streamlined delta-shaped wing suitable for both subsonic and supersonic flight and the second to design an engine that could operate across the vast speed range. The wing would incorporate many subtle dips and curves that would enable the air to flow over its surfaces efficiently, providing lift while reducing drag. With the limitations of 1960s technology, the designers were to invent hundreds of preliminary delta-shaped designs before finally homing in on the now familiar shape of Concorde. After perfecting their new wing using a model in a Mach 2 wind tunnel, the designers would turn to their second major task, the engines. The airplane travelled at 1,350 miles an hour, but the engines could only take air at 500 miles an hour. So we had to slow the air down as it went toward the engine. And we did this by the intake system and adjustable ramps inside the intake. As the air came in, supersonically it hit these ramps and that generated some shock waves which both slowed the air down and created compression inside the intake. And that intake system made Concorde the success that she was. While the British engineers worked on the engine design, their French counterparts in Toulouse studied the effect of stress on the aluminium airframe at high-speed flight. This instrumented model is used to establish the characteristic vibration modes in the airframe structure. High-intensity sound waves generated by Concorde's four Olympus engines could induce fatigue in the adjoining airframe structure. To make sure this doesn't happen, Concorde test specimens are bombarded with noise unlimited. This is just one example of the scale and complexity of new facilities needed and supplied to solve Concorde problems. With the basic testing complete, in both Bristol and Toulouse, the airframes were starting to take shape, paving the way for taxi trials and an historic moment. On the 2nd of March 1969 in Toulouse, in front of the world's press, prototype Concorde 001 took to the skies for the first time. Concorde had become a reality. I think it's a great tribute to the designers of the aeroplane that they got it right first time. We did practically nothing in terms of technical alteration to Concorde during the time that she was flying. Yes, we changed the cabin in the interior four times and updated that to meet modern desires and trends. But the designers and the engineers got it right first time and because it wasn't broke we didn't have to fix it. And that really is a significant achievement. The legacy of Concorde's first flight was to become an everyday occurrence as it graced the skies. For the next 34 years, flying Concorde was to remain as exhilarating as on that historic first day. How could a plumber become an airline pilot overnight? Or a test pilot crash and not burn? Open the door to the world of the Sims. And we're now clear for takeoff. 
From spare rooms in suburbia to combat exercises with the Air Force, the virtual flight is opening up a whole new world of possibilities. I didn't know you could do that. Prepare for takeoff with Sim Night, Friday 30th of January on Discovery Wings. Today's lesson, giving our customers peace of mind. For £15 a month, we look after their whole central heating system. That means parts, labour and unlimited call-outs. To demonstrate the importance of having this fallback, Dave will fall back as if he's a boiler breaking down. But Dave didn't have British Gas Central Heating Care. And now look, it was only £15 a month. It's Weight Watchers from Heinz. As you leave, I want all of you to hand in your essays about what you did in the holidays. That's 48 quid, mate. 48? <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, yeah, thank you. Hey! 48 quid! What are you doing if you're different? <laughs> Only 48 quid. Didn't want the late one then, no? You turn it! And you didn't even use an egg card! You get 0% on balance transfers until the 1st of July 2004. You get 0% on everything you buy until the 1st of July 2004. And you get money back on all your purchases as well. Crack in! Well, at least your shirt fits, unlike some people. Shut up. Sew yourself up now at egg.com. No! It's Weight Watchers from Heinz. I'll be a ballerina when I grow big. I'd like to be an actor as I wear a wig. I'd be an astronaut and go in space for a walk. <laughs> I'd be a crocodile in a river. I'd eat lots of meat, but not liver. Have you got what it takes to inspire children? To find out more about the range of jobs and training opportunities in childcare, phone 0800 Double nine, double six, double O. You want to play our game? Engine our game. Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Engineering dreams and motoring mayhem. Satisfaction. Buckle up for seven hours of maximum satisfaction. Full throttle Saturday from 9 a.m. over on Discovery Channel. Heathrow Airport and Concorde lined up for a sporty departure. Any moment now, he's going to open up the four Rolls-Royce Olympus engines to full power and the reheats will cut in. Three, two, one, now! You can hear the roar increasing as she accelerates to 150 miles an hour. 250 and she rotates and lift off. Concorde climbing away to New York. She'll be there in just over three hours. Shortly after takeoff, the crew would undertake a noise abatement procedure, whereby the reheats would be cut and the power reduced by 15%. The plane would then fly subsonic over land to a point just over the sea, just south of Wales. Once clear of the coastline, the crew would relight the afterburners and apply full power once more, accelerating Concorde through the sound barrier, reaching a maximum speed of around 1,300 miles per hour twice the speed of sound, some 10 miles high. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Captain Chris Norris, uh, cruising along now, 26,000 feet at just under the speed of sound. We're estimating arrival in New York, touching down around 10 minutes past nine. A few minutes later, as Concorde passed through the speed of sound, the only indication of this milestone, a small flicker on a pressure gauge, which picked up the shock wave from the pitot tube on the nose of the aircraft. While the mark meter confirmed the aircraft's speed, the crew scanned the instruments to ensure that everything was set correctly for the supersonic cruise. If you travel in a fighter aeroplane at this speed, you'll be sitting in a pressure suit, breathing through an oxygen mask. 
whereas our passenger sitting back there drinking champagne, flying at more than twice the speed of other aeroplanes, nearly two and a half times the speed of other aeroplanes, considerably higher up than uh, other aeroplanes. And it is again unique, it's the only aeroplane capable of such performance. Until recently we weren't quite the highest people on the planet uh, because there was the Mir station which had astronauts up in space. But uh, now that that is no longer there, the people on this aeroplane today are actually the people furthest above the planet. As Concorde flew at supersonic speeds, the friction on the outside of the airframe increased. To counter this, the plane flew into the stratosphere, where the air was thinner, reducing drag from the denser air at lower altitudes. The other major advantage of cruising at between 50 and 60,000 feet was that nothing else got in the way. Our position at the moment is that we're at 45 degrees north and 57 degrees west. That means that we are to the south of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia in Canada. We obviously choose a routing that keeps us over the sea because uh, that means we can stay supersonic uh, all the way to our final descent into New York. With two distinct supersonic tracks known as Sierra Mike and Sierra November, Concorde was kept clear of land for as long as possible. With practically no winds at these altitudes, Concorde's overall journey time rarely varied by more than a few minutes each day. The restriction coming into New York is that we have to um, be subsonic before we cross the coast, but we in fact choose to do a routing that keeps us off the coast right until we get to Kennedy Airport. So we can stay supersonic right up until the point where we have to start slowing down in order to um, make our landing. And uh, the way we slow down is whatever height we've got to uh, on the Atlantic crossing, we hold that height, bring the speed back to about one and a half times the speed of sound, and then we start descending and also continue slowing up uh, back to the realms of subsonic flight where we mix in with the other subsonic aeroplanes and become just like any other aeroplane landing at Kennedy Airport, controlled by air traffic in New York. Taka 580, Kennedy Tower, Caution Wake Turbulence, the Pine Concord, runway 31 left, taxi into position, all next arrival is uh, 13 miles out. As this Concord started its approach to land at Kennedy Airport, three other of these supersonic airliners were already in the vicinity. With both BA and Air France operating daily, JFK saw more Concords than any other airport in the world. With many residential areas surrounding Kennedy Airport, Concorde, together with older, noisier versions of subsonic jets, was confined to certain runways and an unusual departure and arrival pattern known as the Kanazi. As this final, tightly curved approach edged ever closer, the flight engineer pumped fuel from tanks at the back of the aircraft to ones at the front, balancing Concorde's center of gravity. As it approached the runway, Concorde would be pitched back because of limited lift under its delta-shaped wings, resulting in a greater nose-up angle than other planes. To counter the restricted view caused by this unusual approach, the nose and visor had to be lowered to their maximum droop position in order to give the crew an unrestricted view forward. As the aircraft touched down at 180 miles per hour, the combination of reverse thrust and powerful brakes brought the Concorde to a mere walking place in a matter of around 30 seconds. Three hours and 13 minutes after departure from Heathrow, and in real terms an hour and a half earlier than before they left, the passengers aboard this Concorde flight already had the Big Apple in their sights. The price tag for the luxury of arriving before you leave was not cheap, at over 40 times the price of the cheapest ticket on a jumbo. Not surprisingly, the majority of passengers on board were highly successful business travellers, for whom time was literally money. There's no question it saves not just the hours of the day, it saves the days of the week by making day one an effective one on the other side of the Atlantic. Really, I suppose, everybody was a businessman in one sense or another. Either they were businessmen in the sense that you and I would think about it, or they were sports stars, actors, uh, pop stars, uh, classical musicians, people to whom time was money. Midday, arrive 10 o'clock in the evening Europe time, and go to work on day three back in Europe. Marvellous. 
After a short three and a half hour flight and a 24 hour break downtown, the only drama ahead for the crews returning home the following day was the challenging Kanazi takeoff from JFK. All pilots had to perfect this tricky maneuver on a regular basis in the simulators at Bristol and Paris. So off come the brakes. Three, two, one, now. We open the throttles up and slam them open. It's just a computer input. The reheats light up. The airplane starts to accelerate. At 182 tonnes, acceleration is already better than probably your motor car. We're travelling at 75 miles an hour, starting to increase speed towards the point where we're going to check the engines are functioning correctly. That's 100 knots, power checked. So we continue to go on up towards the speed where we make a decision to commit to the takeoff. That's called V1. Here we are coming up to that speed now, V1, and approaching the speed where we are rotate the airplane to the climb out attitude. As rotates called, I pull back on the control column, pitching Concorde up to about 13 degrees. Shortly after that, we're airborne, positive climb, gear up, turn, roll on 25 degrees of bank. You get an excellent view out of the left-hand side of the aircraft right here as we turn out over the Jamaica Bay. Accelerating up to 250 knots as we approach the noise time. Three, two, one, noise. Reduce the power and switch off the reheats. Cross over the bridge and there we are. New York's JFK Airport has been synonymous with Concorde since 1976. A total of 42 of the jets would fly in and out of JFK every week the majority of which would be seen first thing in the morning. With a powerful environmental lobby living close to the airport, noise sensitivities were high on JFK's agenda. Ironically, Concorde would often benefit from strict noise enforcement by taking off from an empty, less sensitive runway while everybody else had to queue. As the regular transatlantic flights departed for Europe, the morning eastbound Concords taking off around the same time would land at their destinations, Paris and London, when the subsonic jets were still only halfway across the Atlantic. You are going 800 miles an hour or thereabouts faster than they are. And you just sort of look at them down below and they literally go back like this and you sort of wave bye-bye. It was that sort of extraordinary feeling that you weren't moving at all, that you were just hanging suspended in space and waiting for Mother Earth to spin around and for your destination to arrive and you then pulled the throttles back and re-entered and descended and came into land. It was, it was an amazing feeling. Concorde was exhilarating to fly but was technically much more complicated to get underway than other aircraft. With all four engines powered up, the crew had to undertake a complex checklist, reviewing everything from electrical systems to the flying controls. Unlike 21st century airliners, where the workload of the traditional flight deck crew had been largely replaced by computers, Concorde retained a traditional 1960s style cockpit. Its pilots were not only hand-picked for the role, but were acutely aware of the esteem to which they were held within the industry, especially in the US. Well, I can clearly remember flying over the States and other aircraft saying, where's the Concorde? And we'd say, and the controller would say, well, look at uh, one o'clock, right to left. Oh, geez, isn't that a pretty sight? And so we felt extremely flattered. We said, thank you so much for <laughs> appreciating us. Equally in the lift, I can remember Americans getting in, seeing us all in uniform in the hotel, I suppose I ought to call it the elevator, saying, uh, do you guys fly the Concorde? And we said in our little English voices, yes, well, as a matter of fact, we do. America's love affair with this quaint Anglo-French plane remained strong for three decades. Although expensive, noisy, and environmentally incorrect, Concorde was to become a regular fixture at JFK. On an average morning, two Concords left for Paris and London, and meanwhile, another two arrived from London and Paris, all four Concords taking the same supersonic tracks following one another across the Atlantic at 1,300 miles per hour. With only 13 Concords between the two airlines, it was a strange phenomenon that every morning at JFK, a third of the total fleet of this extraordinary aircraft would be under power at the same time. But given the volume of business traffic flowing in and out of New York, it was no surprise that JFK had become synonymous with Concorde. 
people began to realize what a marvelous machine Concord was for crossing the Atlantic. Leave London half past 10, New York slightly before half past nine, in the morning you've traveled backwards in time. It's the whole of the first day being a useful one. And so apart from the uh, elan of actually taking Concord, uh, it proved to be an extremely useful tool to a businessman. This love affair with Concorde had only started to materialize in the mid 80s. Prior to then, both airlines' supersonic fleets had struggled to break even. The government owned airlines management regarded the planes as more of a status symbol rather than a moneymaker. When Concorde went into service with British Airways, the management were not keen, and if you wanted to get anywhere in British Airways, you didn't show an interest in Concorde. That management soon left. It was replaced by Lord King and Sir Colin Marshall as they are now. The idea that Concorde would be a flagship gained force, so the figures on Concorde improved. We negotiated with government in the early 80s to such an extent that the government was then absolved of any financial involvement in the Concorde project. And as that happened, the costs of maintaining Concorde and maintaining a watching brief on Concorde, which the manufacturers have throughout the life of an aircraft, switched from government finance to airline finance. And from that point onwards, we never looked back. Mark two, twice the speed of sound. For the first time in its history, privatization brought with it financial independence. No longer would Concorde be run as a loss-making flagship, its future would be destined by hard economics. Thatcherism had been born, and it was to Jock Lowe that BA turned with a clear message about the jet's future. Concorde must pay, or else. We found out that the passengers didn't know what the fare was. And we also found out that they were also very senior. They were the chairman, they were the directors, they were a layer of, of people who were entitled to Concorde travel. So they didn't know what the fare was, and when we asked them to guess, they guessed that the fare was higher than it actually was. So we just simply began to charge them what they thought they were paying. That brought in extra money. But we also cut real costs. For instance, the number of captains came down from 31 uh, to 19. Now that's a big saving, and we did that all round. And finally, we looked at the product. What service were, were we giving? Were the timings right? Were we giving too much, too little, and so on? Um, and I suppose the final aspect of that is we started to use the aeroplane to market itself. We started to do lots of interviews telling everyone it was a success because that's what the general public wanted to hear, that it was a success. They didn't want to hear about it losing money. And luckily, these things all came together and we began to make money. Uh, we began to make a lot of money. With Jock Lowe at the helm, BA's Concorde balance sheet shifted from a £16 million annual loss to a £40 million profit within a year. Concorde had proved that it had two major assets that would pull in the punters, speed and charisma. With the New York operation predominantly aimed at business travellers, BA decided to try out a new tack and divert one of its lightly used weekend London New York flights to Barbados instead. With a burgeoning tourism industry, the island was becoming increasingly popular with the rich and famous. Concorde was to prove the ultimate tool for the jet set heading to the Caribbean as it had been for the business traveller between London and New York. But back at BA's headquarters, opinion was divided about further flight destinations. There was a bit of a battle inside BA because one aeroplane was on the ground and there were plans to put another one on the ground. And we said, no, no, we want to fly them. Uh, we're going to make money with them. We had done two charters. We had done a charter for Brian Calvert, who was the first BA pilot for his pub in 1978, and for the Daily Mirror, 1977. Uh, but that was all. And then we said, no, this, this is a market. It's an achievable dream. People want to go on it. Having won the internal battle, BA's new proactive team set to work finding willing external partners to market and charter the aircraft, leaving the airline with a risk-free and lucrative additional source of cash flow for its high-cost fleet. 
This formula was to prove an outstanding success for BA and its new partners. You could fly Concorde, convince your potential buyer that it's worth buying your product, you could say thank you to your best salesman, or you could just tell Granny how, what a wonderful lady she was and how everybody loved her. It, it just had that ability. It could be used. The aircraft was a tool, not just for the businessman, but for, for everybody else in every other walk of life. They'd f everybody would find Concorde fitted somewhere, and they wanted to experience it and, and, uh, and enjoy it. But across the channel, Air France's government-backed management were to watch the success of charters in the UK with interest and ultimately boost their own books by flying a number of Paris-to-Paris one-hour loop flights out over the Bay of Biscay. But at around a thousand US dollars for a seat to end up back where you started, would this gamble pay off? Behold the beauty of my true love. The romance of radar, the airport lounge, the thrill of the wait, oh joy of rubber pawn runway. What graceful ballet directs your aerial dance, oh spacious seating plan. Fly, sweet bird, soar, great albatross, while I can but envy your flight. Discovery Wings, passionate about flight.